Someone turn that off. I have the DVD. Alright, I'll take it. See if you're on the camera or not, but uh, welcome to the uh, 145 session. Uh, it's the uh, psychology session, and we'll have a couple of presentations today. Uh, we'll be starting out with uh, Doris, Lauren, Lark, and Morgan. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, empathy and the perception of a depressed classmate. And uh, the way this will work is we'll do the regular presentation, and then we'll have a few minutes after each presentation for questions. <clears throat> so if you could kind of have your questions prepared for uh, when the presentation ends, you can put them into your chat box, and then they'll be read out loud uh, so that the speakers can answer the questions. Okay. And with that, I think we're ready to get started. So we'll hand over to them. Take it away, Kayla. Hi, thank you for coming to our presentation today. We will be discussing Empathy, Perception of the Depressed Classmate by Doris Lark, Lauren and Morgan at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. This research was part of our personality psychology lab this semester. Our study evaluated the efficacy of an intervention to reduce public stigma towards an individual exhibiting signs of a mental illness. This was done through a character vignette where a professor gave an empathetic reminder when considering peer review grades. One student in the vignette exhibited symptoms of depression. There's a lot of research on the stereotypes and resulting harm surrounding depressed individuals. Unfortunately, depression is very common. A study of 562 college counseling centers revealed the top three concerns of American college students are anxiety, depression, and relationship problems. 48.6% of the students served by these counseling centers were seeking aid for depression. We also know that for the last decade, roughly one in 10 college students have attempted suicide. In fact, 64% of college students cite mental illness as the reason they dropped out of college. So we know depression abundantly exists within the college setting, and that it's not always perceived well by their classmates. Specifically, there was a study that asked participants if they agreed with various statements about depressed individuals, and they found that about half the participants agreed that depressed individuals were hard to talk to and unpredictable. Roughly 20% of the participants agreed that depressed individuals would never fully recover and could pull themselves together if they wanted. This was actually a follow-up study to the UK's extensive three-year Mental Health Matters campaign that educated the population on mental illness. So even after an extensive education and awareness intervention, significant stigma still prevailed. On top of that, education interventions are cost prohibitive and not the easiest to bring into the classroom. We wanted to see if an emotion-focused strategy as opposed to a problem-focused strategy would have a beneficial effect on decrease and decrease the effects of stigma. We hypothesized that participants already high in empathy would give the depressed classmate a higher grade. And we also hypothesized that participants exposed to our empathy intervention would give a higher grade as well. So our study consisted of 38 participants and were recruited online via social media. Uh, our participants were predominantly female and ages ranged from 18 to 41 and older. They differed in race, sexuality, religion, and nationality. Our materials included four surveys and two short story scenarios. A demographic scale was given to gather background information on our study's participants. The Toronto Empathy Scale was administered to assess levels of empathy. It included statements like, I enjoy making others feel better, and when someone else is excited, I tend to get excited too, which were answered on a five-point Likert scale. The Patient Health Questionnaire 9 measured levels of depression in participants. This survey consists of questions like, over the last two weeks, how often have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless, which were answered on a four-point Likert scale. Participants were also given a short story scenario where they imagined they were a member of a group project with two other students. One of those students had shown symptoms of depression throughout the semester. Those in the experimental condition received an empathy reminder from the professor in the scenario, while those in the control group did not. And finally, the peer review survey evaluated levels of stigma toward the depressed student. The intervention or empathy reminder given by the imaginary professor and the experimental group read, some of you have reached out to me about making up credit, which I will consider case by case. It's been a tough semester for everyone, so remember to be considerate. You never know what someone else is going through. So for our procedure, uh, first, participants electronically signed in a form consent form via Google Forms. 
and then they completed the demographic survey. Then participants were separated into two groups by the first letter of their last name. Uh, group A through L read the short story scenario without the empathy reminder, while group M through Z read the short story with the empathy reminder. All participants then completed the three remaining surveys and were then debriefed on the study. Because of first hypothesis, we did an independent sample t-test, which showed that there was no significant difference between participants with high empathy levels and low empathy levels on hypothetical project scores for the correct student. We did another independent sample t-test for our second hypothesis, which showed the empathy reminder group reported significantly higher hypothetical project scores for the depressed student compared to the control group. So um, the study did not support our first hypothesis, um, but it did support our second hypothesis. So our first hypothesis, just a reminder of what that was, was that people who were more, that scored higher in empathy would also um, perceive the student as in more positive ways, but that turned out to not be the case. Um, the control group was significantly more likely to perceive the depressed student as lazy and inconsiderate, um, and the empathy group was significantly less likely to just perceive the depressed student as lazy and inconsiderate. So the implications of our study was that an empathetic reminder can influence um, the perception of others and the stigma towards mental illness in a positive way. Um, the emotion focused strategy from the professor was successful. So basically education about these types of interventions seemed to be effective in improving the way that people perceive mental illness. Um, even participants naturally low in empathy can be affected by the empathy reminder. So a couple of our limitations in the study. Uh, first, we had a lack of situational realism. Uh, obviously, we couldn't recreate the situation due to COVID, um, but having an in-person study might have been more effective for us. Um, we also had a relatively small sample size of 38 participants. Um, as I mentioned, it was conducted virtually, so there might have not been as much um, engagement as we might have liked. Um, and also, social desirability bias and self-report measures. Any questions? Yeah, we have an in-person question back here. I guess I can be in charge of those. <laughs> Dr. Coates. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was wondering, uh, were people mostly, did you feel like the sample, sample was pretty high in empathy in general? Like, were they pretty high on the scale? Um, I wonder if that could have affected the results if it, most people were high or most people were low. You didn't have a lot of data. Right. I believe it was somewhere down the middle. It was pretty equal in part. So, yeah, I wouldn't think that that would affect it. Yeah. So then um, another interesting part of the study was that there could have been different results. So we found results of them like labeling them as like lazy or inconsiderate and things like that. But then also we measured like what grade they would have given them in the class. So people could have very well have given them um, like a good grade, but then still said that they were lazy and inconsiderate. So there's also the difference there. Yeah, because we did find that those who were given the empathy reminder actually gave the depressed student a significantly higher letter grade than those who didn't get that reminder. Um, and the question, how did we measure empathy? We used the Toronto Empathy Scale, so it's not a scale that we made on our own. It's just one that we got online that we knew was like effective. quick application question for you guys too just um, based on your results do you think that this would be worthy advice to give like a professor to give instruction something like that in their class if they had students who were dealing with mental illness or something that were in a group project like would you advise them to say this would be a useful way to help them more 
be more fair, or do you think you know enough yet to advise that? Um, I mean, like we said in the study, we kind of lack that real life scenario. Um, but I mean, based off of what we found, I would say that it wouldn't hurt to have professors incorporate that into their teaching methods. Um, obviously, there would need to be further research to see how that actually applies in the classroom setting, but I think that it could be useful. And I also think, like, as we're researching this, just with the whole stigma aspect, I think some people, just the way that they perceive mental illness, it's like, they would even say, like, even if they're given that empathy reminder, it's still not excusable type of thing. Like, the way that they perceive, like, your responsibility to, like, your group is more important than, you know, whatever else. So that would also be an interesting aspect. Because we did ask an open-ended question. Um, we asked if they thought that grades should be adjusted based off of, like, personal problems such as depression. And it was kind of split. A lot of people were kind of down the middle saying maybe it depends. Um, but some people did say no, it's never an excuse. So. Mm -hmm. to apply to real life situations. Yeah. I wonder too, if, if you have a lot of participants who were psychology students, if that would be different than if you have an individual with very relevant as major or right. 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 probably since like they'd have like a background at least with yeah. it. We, so. we did have a demographic question that asked what their major was and I believe that a lot of them yeah. were like in the field of psychology. Yeah. Common and simply cool study. Further research is not necessary for empathy to be expressed as a human courtesy, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of the idea behind your study in general. And why it's a little surprising when you didn't show more effects from just your natural personality level of empathy. Right. Uh, more empathetic people should show more of an effect or something. And I mean, that's why one of the limitations is social desirability because while they're taking that empathy survey, a participant might think, well, I'm not going to say that I, you know, don't like it when others feel good. So there might have been more people who were higher in empathy, but who really aren't. Yeah, it's a hard question to ask people what they would do when advising someone else's grade until you're in that situation and you're like, right. I don't want them to get a good grade just because they're having struggles. Like, right. it's certainly self-relevant to your own grade, and so it could be a different kind of answer, I guess. All right, well, nice job, guys. I don't know if we all managed uh, giving them a hand <laughs> online. It's a little less loud, but it works. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and go on with our second speaker today is uh, Abigail Butterfield, and she's going to be talking to us about empowering people to change their behavior and improve their well being. Okay, so, Julie Abby. Yeah, thank you. So, um, hi everyone, thank you for joining in. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, so this is the research project that I did for my senior thesis um, in the psychology department. Um, I was really interested in the topic of well-being as sort of someone who had just come out of a time of lower well-being in my life. And so I was sort of interested in how that could be improved upon, uh, especially resulting in behavior change and like lifestyle change and things like that. And I found that empowerment was a really big part of that. So I'll go ahead and start with some background information about well-being. Um, so firstly, what is well-being? Um, essentially, when we think about it in terms of the literature, in terms of psychology, um, it's basically the state of optimal function that is a key component in mental health. And it's often coined as this term for happiness in sort of psychological literature. So Basically, when we say what is well-being, it's just sort of your sense of happiness in layman's terms. But um, in psychology, it's kind of described in three different dimensions that work together to create this overall sense of happiness. And the first one is positive affect, which is basically 
this ability or this experience of positive emotions and how those positive, positive emotions are used to take on challenges in a positive way that you experience in life. And the negative aspect is kind of the other side of that coin where it's experiencing those negative emotions, especially in relation to life's challenges. And so those two experiences of positive and negative aspect kind of work together in a relationship to create this sense of life satisfaction. And so typically you see when you have higher positive affect, you also have higher life satisfaction. And that sort of overall sensation that those three constructs or dimensions make is your overall sense of well-being or happiness. And so when we move forward, this is kind of what we're talking about, is those different experiences and how they affect your life. And so I want to discuss why it's super important to talk about well-being or happiness in general. And it's important because high levels of well-being are associated with a number of other outcomes, including, in a very general sense, greater academic achievement and engagement, greater social support, better physical health, reduced stress, and improved coping strategies. And again, these are very sort of broad categories of outcomes that are associated with high levels of well-being. So you can really get into the minutia of, like, if you have high levels of well-being, you have this specific benefit, um, and there's numerous benefits of those. So having a good sense of well-being, having an improved sense of happiness is very important in pretty much every domain of life. And so when there's sort of an absence of good well-being, then we see a lot of negative aspects as well. So that's why it's very important to think about how can we find ways to cultivate, encourage, and improve well-being in our society with our individual people because it's very important in our life. And so there are lots of strategies to do this. As I found when researching this um, in the very first semester of my thesis during the synthesis portion, I found that there are numerous, numerous ways to improve well-being. And all of these different strategies play on different relationships with other constructs of well-being. So for example, resilience is very important in sort of the well-being research. And so there's a lot of strategies that work on improving resilience to improve well-being. But the, the specific sort of construct that I found important and that I found important in terms of empowerment and behavior change was self-determination theory. And so if you're not familiar with self-determination theory, it's basically this idea that there are three main psychological needs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, that need to be satisfied in order to, in order to sort of achieve optimal development and high levels of well-being. And basically, these three needs, autonomy being feeling like you're in control, so experiencing freedom in one's behavior, feeling like you're in control of your situation, of your life, of what's going on, feeling like you can handle it and that sort of thing. Competence is kind of just a sense of confidence, feeling like um, you can take on challenges effectively and function effectively while doing challenges. So it's feeling capable in a general sense. And then relatedness is having this sort of sense of belonging and kind of experiencing that what you're doing is meaningful and also that you're supported in that. So autonomy, feeling in control, confidence, feeling capable, and relatedness, feeling supported is what we're talking about here. So when these three, when you sort of feel these things in your life, then that is related to having higher levels of well-being. And so it's very important that um, we sort of satisfy these needs in order to see higher levels of well-being. And there are many tools, like I said, that, that capitalize on this relationship between psychological needs and well-being in order to improve well-being and cause this sort of behavior change. And the reason why these strategies are effective, especially in the context of like changing your lifestyle and making long-term changes to how you go about your daily life is because they kind of work with this sense of empowerment, right? And empowerment is um, very important in terms of well-being as well. And well-being has actually been found to be an outcome of empowerment. So when you're feeling empowered as an individual, you tend to have higher well-being. So you can see how all of these things are related, where you have higher psychological need satisfaction, you feel empowered, and so you have better well-being. And so this is why this relationship is really important. So when we, when I sort of under, started to understand this relationship, the question became, okay, so we want to be able to empower people so that they can improve their psychological need satisfaction so they can have better well-being. So how do we do that? How do we foster empowerment? And the answer kind of, again, goes back to that self-determination theory with autonomy-supported environments. 
And basically what these are, are situations, mind, sort of states of mind, um, environments, things like that, that play on this idea of letting the individual feel like they're in control, right? Autonomy supported, feeling in control supported environment. And again, this would increase your satisfaction of autonomy, that psychological need. And the reason that this works so well for empowering people is because it plays on this idea of intrinsic motivation, where individuals feel motivated because of something inside of them as opposed to any external motivation. And that makes sense, how you can have you know, more sense of control, feel more capable, feel more supported. You're, you don't need all those external motivators to change your behavior, to do something different in your life. And so these autonomy-supported environments create this sort of sense of intrinsic motivation, which is in a really important part of feeling empowered. And so that's how these environments, autonomy-supported environments, foster empowerment. And so the specific sort of autonomy supported environment that I chose to focus on is called solution focused self reflection. And it basically plays on all of these different constructs that are working together. Um, the sort of solution focused and self reflective part increase sort of this sense of, or the satisfaction of psychological needs, which, as I mentioned, increases your sense of well being or is related to that. Um, and also plays upon this idea of empowerment because it's an autonomy supported environment. So that solution-focused self-reflection is the specific autonomy-supported environment that I chose to investigate. And so I have a few hypotheses related to this. Um, in the full thesis that I did, I had many more sort of related to the other demographics, but um, for this presentation, I wanted to focus on the two main hypotheses. So the first one is that participants in these autonomy-supported environments will have higher need satisfaction, feel more capable and in control, and therefore, they'll change their behavior to improve their well-being, which would be demonstrated in an increasement, an increased engagement in wellness strategies. Additionally, I predicted that participants that felt empowered by the experience would also have higher need satisfaction. They would feel more autonomous and more competent. And so I'll go ahead and move to the methodology of how I collected this. I'll start with the participants. So I had 63 Westminster College students as my participants, ages 18 to 22. There were 10 males, but 53 females, so we had quite a skewed population there, but that's okay. And then um, in terms of race and, race and ethnicity, we had 52 white participants, five black, five Hispanic, and one that identified as other. The control and experimental conditions were determined by the first letter of their last name. So last names A through M uh, were the control condition. There were 40 participants in that. Um, and then the experimental conditions were last names A through Z. And there were 23 of those. So we had a little bit skewed there, but we'll talk about that later. So for my procedure, and I'll talk about the materials as I go through the procedure, um, everything was conducted online because this was um, conducted in the fall of 2020. So we were still in this COVID era and all research was done online. So I did all these through um, online forms that started with an introduction to the study and an informed consent. Um, and then they began by uh, the participants were, they were given a form specific to their name. So they were automatically sorted into the experimental and control conditions. But in both conditions, they read a scenario about Marie, who was a hypothetical college age student that was struggling with well being specific to the well being struggles that college students typically have. So struggling in classes, struggling to balance work and school, um, having really difficult tests or exams or presentations coming up, not doing as well as they want, all of those things that many of the college students, I'm sure, sound familiar to us at this time in the semester. Um, so th that scenario was meant to sort of get them thinking about those different struggles that they may experience themselves. And then after reading through sort of Marie's problem, they read about various strategies that have been sort of proven or at least shown to improve well-being. And the purpose for this part was one, well, both parts were to kind of prime them to be thinking specifically about changing their behavior in terms of well-being, but then also specific to the strategy section, I wanted the participants to be educated on how they could actually improve their own well-being instead of just coming up with solutions on their own. I wanted them to see and read about what actually worked. And so that was the purpose of that section of reading about various strategies. And then after that, they completed a guided worksheet. And this was the autonomy-supported environment part of the procedure. 
And the guided worksheet was basically just a series of questions. The control group had a series of six questions that were only solution focused. So they answered questions trying to solve the problems about Marie, but they didn't ever think about that in terms of themselves. But the experimental group had the autonomy for supported environment that added that self-reflective aspect, which is very important in behavior change, especially in well-being and behavior change. So they had six additional questions. The first six were still about Marie and solving her problems, but the latter six kind of turned the tails to focus more inward on themselves and think about how do I relate to Marie's struggles? What can I do in my own life to improve my well-being? What are some specific things I'm struggling with? So it added this, it gave them that sort of sense of control, um, that autonomy aspect to say, okay, what am I struggling with and how can I fix it? And so that was that autonomy supported environment. And then once they completed that, uh, whether it was the shortened version for the control group or the uh, longer version for the experimental group, they all completed the psychological need satisfaction scale, which just measured how basically satisfied their psychological needs were. Um, and it was just kind of to give a baseline of sort of well-being levels. And then they completed the demographic survey, which basically asked some typical demographic stuff, age, um, race, race and ethnicity, uh, majors, any involvements that they had, like group life, athletics, other organizations, working, those sort of things. And then after they completed this, I sent out a follow-up survey a week after they completed the survey. And the purpose of the follow-up survey was to measure that change in behavior. Um, oh my gosh, some, something just popped up, but I'm gonna ignore it. Anyway, um, something that I wanted to measure their change in behavior. So this follow-up survey measured how, um, how many wellness strategies they used. It measured um, how likely they were to continue using all those different constructs that kind of gave me an idea of, did the autonomy support an environment prompt them to change their behavior. So that's what the follow-up survey was for. Um, and then we come to the results. And spoiler alert, they were, none of them were significant. So this may be a little bit boring, but it's still important work. So the first hypothesis, as it says, was not significant. And this was showing using an independent sample speed test showed the difference in the number of well-being strategies used between the control condition and the experimental condition. And so this, you can see in this graph here, they were essentially the same. They were not significantly different. So both groups used about the same number of well-being strategies after that one week period after having done experienced the autonomy supported environment. Additionally, my hypothesis too was not significant, so it wasn't necessarily supported. And this independent sample speed test showed that there was no difference between the psychological need satisfaction scores of the two conditions. So essentially that means that both the control condition and the experimental condition had about the same amount of psychological need satisfaction, and therefore we can infer about the same amount of well-being. Um, so what does this all mean? And so basically what this means on the surface is that the autonomy supported environment that I created with the guided worksheet wasn't necessarily effective. It didn't cause the participant to engage in any additional um, wellness strategies to change their behavior. But this is kind of, uh, can be misleading to the, actual, to the you know, um, results because the participants, as demonstrated in this graph, already had very high levels of psychological need satisfaction, which implies that they had higher levels of well-being. Um, and so the need satisfaction scale was measured using a seven point Likert scale with seven being sort of the highest level of need satisfaction. Um, they answered statements um, with answers of like, completely agree that all related to sort of their sense of autonomy, competence and relatedness. And so you can see here that almost all of the levels are at five or above, which indicates that they had pretty high levels of need satisfaction. And so this sort of implies that they didn't really need the autonomy supported environment because they were already feeling autonomous. They were already feeling competent. They were already feeling related. So they didn't need to improve upon it necessarily, but they were already there. And so it may not have been that the autonomy supported environment wasn't effective. It just wasn't needed, which is ultimately a good thing because this means that their well being is already in a great spot and they didn't really need to improve upon their well being. Um, but even with that conclusion that I sort of made to give myself a silver lining, there's still some 
limitations that I have, as you might expect. One, of course, being a small sample size, um, is, which is typical, although I did pretty well collecting since then. Uh, but more importantly, the, most of the participants were primarily white female. Um, and so this obviously made a very specific picture of what white female students on Westminster campus experience. And it didn't really show what other people experience. That's obviously a very specific sort of demographic there. Uh, additionally, as the other group mentioned, the online format um, and, and more specifically the online follow-up surveys kind of pose some challenges because the um, the autonomy supported environment and just really the experience in general may not have been as effective or had as much engagement as I would have hoped um, just because we couldn't really control the environment participants were doing the study in. And then the surveys had, uh, the follow-up surveys had some variability in response time, which was a problem as well. Um, so I didn't really account for that. But the most important limitation that I would probably change moving forward is the way that I measured whether or not the autonomy supported environment was effective. So essentially, I measured its effectiveness by um, measuring the number of well-being change, like well-being strategies that and what I did not account for was one, whether or not they were already doing them before they did the study. And also like that may not have really truly represented the effectiveness of the environment. They may not have been related enough to do so. And so moving forward, that's something that I would want to adjust if I were to do the study again or move beyond the study was kind of changing the way that that's measured to maybe have a more effective result. Um, I think there was some, I didn't really measure that well, but, and then lastly, COVID-19 is, is a, a limitation just because this is a really unique situation in terms of well-being, as, as the other group mentioned as well, and some other people have throughout the day. Um, you know, we're not usually in a pandemic, and so well-being levels can be really altered because of that, and so, who knows what changes that may have seen. I'm sure we'll see in the coming years the effects of the pandemic, but that certainly made a very unique situation for these participants in terms of well-being, but I think affected the results as well. But in general, that's what I did. So if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I had a question. So you mentioned that like some of the typical struggles that college students go through mm -hmm. happen at this time of the semester. And I know that it wouldn't really be possible to collect data this time of semester. So do you think that because you had to collect your data earlier, that could have affected levels of well-being? Absolutely. You know, I was collecting this last semester kind of at the middle of the year during October. So you could think that midterms might have affected it, but it certainly wasn't spring semester finals, which as we are all experiencing is wildly insane. <laughs> um, and so it very well could have had an effect on just, you know, people kind of in a lull hitting their stride. There wasn't really a lot of extra things to worry about. So I think the timing of the collection of the data in the semester is super important. Um, and I think it very well could have changed just at any time that I collected it. You know, think about the beginning of the year, you know, any time it could have been different. And so. Um, it'd be interesting to look at those differences just in terms of well-being levels in general. I think that's important for people in higher education to note when they're working with college students, but I, I imagine that this is Cameron Gilbert has a question on chat. Uh, says that, do you think people who are at a better state of well-being are more, are more likely to take a survey which could have skewed the results? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. One thing that I sort of mentioned in my paper and sort of a more expanded explanation of this topic was that many of the participants that per, like that engaged in the study were very involved and um, did a lot of extracurricular things, which in my previous research in my synthesis paper showed that it was related to higher levels of well-being. Usually when you have that sort of increased engagement, you also have increased levels of well-being. And all of the participants have that. So I think it's very likely that that's the case where, you know, they were sort of already had those higher levels of well-being and therefore were sort of more engaged, more likely to do sort of things like that. Um, I'm also pretty involved, so I recruited a lot of my participants from the circles that I'm involved in. And so I think there was maybe a little bit of a bias there of like, oh, let's help Abby with her study. Um, and so I imagine that 
that has an impact on, on it too, of just like who is likely to do a study. Um, it's who you know, but also like, yeah, I'm not really stressed right now. I can take the time to do this and that affects well being. So I, I think it's very likely that the participants were participated because they had good well being and they were able to. Uh, Connor Zollner has a question as well. His question is, how is self-determination theory related to or different than cognitive behavioral therapy and the VSCO study? Okay, so um, I didn't do a ton of looking into cognitive behavioral therapy for this study, but um, I, I don't have a very good answer, but I would say that the main difference is that the theory, the self-determination theory is sort of the basis for ideas, like it's not a treatment in itself, it just sort of provides evidence that leads to treatments and strategies. So like, because there is a relationship between psychological need satisfaction and well-being, people are like, okay, well, let's improve autonomy so we can improve well-being. So it's not necessarily a treatment model in itself, like CBT is or cognitive behavioral therapy is a treatment model in itself. So I think you could use the ideas of a self-determination theory in treatment models, but they're not, it's not a treatment model in itself. I don't know if I explained the question well, but they're kind of a little bit, it's like a precursor to a treatment model, I guess. Yeah, that's a good question though. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, speaking of treatment, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of applied, like, you know, occupational therapy, how might self-determination theory be relevant in a, a situation where you're helping people mm -hmm. with their skills? Yeah, well, I think in any therapy, uh, but especially in those kind of therapies where there's like a very specific goal, it's super important to kind of create that that autonomy, autonomy supportive environment where you create that sense of like the per, the whoever the treatment is happening on, you know, like that they're in control, that they're capable of getting better, and that they feel supported by the people around them, which includes the therapist, their family, or you know whoever's helping them with treatment, their educators, if they're a child or they're a college student. And so creating that and really like sort of fostering those psychological needs and making sure they get satisfied, I imagine has a huge impact on the outcome of the therapy, um, especially when you think about, you know, I'm particularly interested in pediatrics and children with special needs. And so thinking about that population, you know, if they don't feel like they can do it, then there, there's going to be a really defeatist attitude and they can't, or not as likely to improve and the improvements may not be as effective as what they would be if they're you know, excited about it and they feel like they can do it and they feel like they're in control, like that's a huge part. And that's why it was so important for me to discuss in just general well-being and behavior change is because that sense of feeling like you can do it is a big part of improving your life, especially when you want to improve it yourself. And then again, sort of like self changes and lifestyle changes is a huge part of that. questions from anyone in person or online? All right, well, I'm going to give Abby a hand as well. Okay, well, I think that's all we have for this session uh, today. So the next uh, available session, other than jumping into sessions that are uh, still going on, uh, I believe is the three o'clock uh, ice cream you know, social that you can take part of. I do believe that's only in person. I don't think they have a virtual option for that one. So I definitely uh, recommend you guys to step outside of your rooms, get some fresh air and see actual three-dimensional people. Uh, we've definitely enjoyed the experience of getting to still carry out this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity for people to present their research. Um, it's also great to see people in person too. So I hope you're able to enjoy that today. And thanks for coming to enjoy our session today.